Adhyashnadi devotees, please accept my humble obeisances always to Shil Prabhupada. Um, happy Vijay Dasmi to all of you. Uh, hope you are having a wonderful um, festival. Uh, thank, um, I welcome all of you to His Holiness Chandra Mauli Swami Maharaj's daily call. Um, today we are going to continue with the Srimad Bhagavatam series of uh, First Canto Chapter 9. And today's verse is uh, verse number 31. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All to Shil Prabhupada. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving your valuable association to all of us today. Um, you can please take over, Guru Maharaj. I'll just share my screen. Sorry. Yeah. Let's go. Um, we're continuing from the chapter nine of the first canto. Uh, this is text number 31 and the passing away of Grandfather Bhishma Day. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Visudaya Dharanaya Hatar Subhas. Ariksaya Vasu Gata Yudam Shramaha Nivritta Samvendriya Vritta Vibramas Pristava Janam Visri Jan Janardanam By pure meditation, looking at Lord Sri Krishna, he at once was freed from all material inauspiciousness and was relieved from all bodily pains caused by the error wounds. Thus, all the external activities of the senses were born to stop, and he prayed transcendentally to the controller of all living beings while quitting his material body. Therefore, the material body is a gift of the material energy, technically called illusion. <laughs> Interesting statement. The material body is a gift of the material energy, technically called illusion. Identification with the material body is due to a forgetfulness of our eternal relationship with the Lord. For pure devotee of the Lord, like Bhishma Dev, this illusion was at once removed as soon as the Lord arrived. Lord Krishna is like the sun, the illusionary external energy is like darkness. In the presence of the sun, there's no possibility that darkness can stand. Therefore, just on the arrival of Lord Krishna, all material contamination was completely removed. And Vishnu Day was thus able to be transcendentally situated by stopping the activities of the pure senses and co collaboration with matter. The soul is originally pure, and so also is the senses. By material contamination, the senses assume the role of imperfection and impurity. By revival of contact with the Supreme Pure Lord Krishna, the senses again become free from material contamination. Vishwadeva attained all these transcendental conditions prior to his leaving the material body because of the Lord's presence. The Lord is the controller and benefactor of all living beings. This is the Vedic of the Vedas. He is the supreme entity. I mean, he is the supreme eternity, eternity and living entity amongst all of the eternal living beings. And he alone provides all the necessities of all kinds of all living beings. Thus, he provided all facilities to fulfill the transcendental desire of his great devotee, Bhishma Dev, to pray as follows. Om Gyan Kumara Kusya Gyan Arjuna Sarafa Chakshuri. That's my Shri Kudu Veda Maha. In the one on Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Kusya Bhutale, Shri Mahti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Namine. Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gonga Rani, Pachari Munir, Jesa Sunya Ravi, Kusya Kuhari, Kaine. Panchikalpa through this Jaffi Bhasindu Dev, the Jaffi Bhutanam Bhavane Gil, 
So the bodily conception of life is quite strong, even for persons who perform devotional activities. Due to those who are being situated in a material body, life after life, we develop this as a normalcy. We think that to have a material body and to take care of the material body and to further the desires of the material body is the focus of life. And therefore, life after life, this, this idea is compounded where it becomes so solidified that one cannot conceive beyond anything, even with good instruction. Prabhupada so was uh, speaking to a very quite aristocratic couple in uh, one South American country, along with two other devotees. And uh, he was saying that, uh, he was trying to explain to the couple, couple, couple that they are a soul. And they were listening, but the lady, kept saying, yes, I know, I'm a soul, but I'm a female soul. In other words, she was identifying the gender of the soul along with her particular material gender and thinking that that is how the soul is identified. So the bodily conception of life is so strong that even when one hears the absolute knowledge, one cannot understand it. And even with so uh, Great amounts of intelligence. That's why Krishna, in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, more than any other topic, he explains the difference between the body and the soul. From verses 12 all the way to verses 29 in the first, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna shows the difference between what is temporary, what is eternal, what is matter, what is spirit, what is the soul, what is the body. Using many examples, in order to illustrate that point, he constantly directs our attention to the understanding that, yes, we have a material body, but we are not the material body. Even if the body, we, even if we don't have a material body, we live. We live completely and purely. So the material body is simply a feature of our desire to live in this material world and enjoy material energy. So that illusion is very strong. <laughs> and um, in order to break that, one has to engage in what we say, absorption in devotional service. Only when one is absorbed in devotional service can they slowly extricate themselves from the understanding that they are not the body, and that the, the body is simply being used in order to perform activities and to live in this world. But it's more like, I mean, of course, the perfect example, which we use all the time, it's like a car that takes the passenger or the driver from one place to another. It's nothing more than that. That's, that's an example that is quite clear that we get in and out of the car and the soul goes into the body and leaves the body and uses the car where it wants to go and to do what it wants to do. But simply, that is our existence in this world. But that is due, that's contaminated consciousness. That means our consciousness is polluted by this conception that we are something different than who we actually are. And because of that strong amalgamation of this consciousness which comes life after life, the conditioned soul in the material world is called nitya bhada. Nitya means eternal, bhada means The siddha, those who are they're free from material contamination, they never become contaminated by the material. They stay in the spiritual world 
they are the majority of the living entities. This is a small portion of all of the living entities in existence are actually come to this material world. And that small portion, of course, from a material calculation is quite beyond our ability to even count. There's no number you can actually say that this is this how many living entities are. There. So this Nitya Bhada, eternally conditioned, is kind of like a way of saying that because we have been in this material world, life after life and different species of life, that the material, that the living entity traverses through the different realms of material existence in the lower planets, the higher planets, and the middle planets, and down. It's more like a merry-go-round, if you know this little uh, entertainment program that they have, it's called a merry-go-round. It's a big platform that's in a circle, and then we have these horses attached to these poles, and you sit on the horse, and the platform spins around, and the horses go up and down. It's a ride for kids, mostly. And you're going up and down and around and around. So this is our situation in the material world. We are going around and around. Birth, death, disease, and old age. Birth, death, disease, and old age. Just a continual circle carrying us around and around. And up and down means in different realms of material existence. But this has been going on for lives for millions of lives. But the view of that consciousness that solidifies that is it's very hard and even impossible to understand you are not the body. You are the soul within the body. I mean, sometimes when we dream at night, we go into a different state of affair and we leave our gross body behind. And sometimes we even take on a different body in the dream state. And we see ourselves in the dream. We're watching ourselves in the dream and experiencing something in the dream from the point of view of watching. But because we identify with the person in the dream, we also think that what's happening in the dream is happening to me. But it's simply a dream state. And so in the same way, when we come back out of the dream state, we come to this, what we say, working reality. And we, again, we assume our identity and activities on this level, which is another form of dreaming. Because we are also, we can also watch ourselves and we, what we do, what, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. And we can step back from that and see, oh, I'm thinking like this, I'm acting like this, I'm speaking like this, and I'm desiring like this. We can also take that step back. So that is actually consciousness of the soul's existence reflecting on its external existence as a material body. So here, um, Bishmadev, he is riddled with arrows. Great souls are on the battlefield. And he's speaking to Yudhisthira, giving him relevant instructions on how to take the kingdom, rule the kingdom, accept the kingdom as the arrangement of the Lord. Now Krishna comes. <laughs> and Krishna comes into the scene, and then Bishmadev turns his focus fully on Krishna. And as soon as he does that, it says that you know, his external activities at once stopped. He started to offer beautiful prayers to the Lord. And it's interesting, all his bodily pains caused by the arrows were also done. In other words, simply by the presence of Krishna, he transcended everything material and was situated in pure spiritual consciousness. As we use the example quite often, as one gets closer to the heat of the fire, one becomes warmer and warmer. So as one becomes closer and closer to Krishna, one becomes less and less affected by the atmosphere of this material energy. And then when one is completely in that association, one is no longer feeling anything that has to do with the material world. 
um, here, or this verse reminded me of someone that I personally knew very closely, a disciple, you all know him, his name was Janikina. He departed the world in July 17th, 2021, just a little over a year ago. And he was, he was undergoing tremendous amount of pain. And he was in his last stages of life. He was with one particular devotee who was taking care of him. And uh, he didn't want any care from the hospital people who wanted to simply go through his last stages here. But at one point, and this is described by the devotee who was there, that uh, everything changed. His pain stopped. He sat up in a transcendental position, another lotus position. His eyes got big. A beautiful smile appeared on his face. It was like he had reached transcendence. And just at that point, he was gone. When Krishna came, or Krishna's representative, came to take him back to the spiritual world. And in those last few moments, all of what he was undergoing on the physical level, the pain and the atmosphere of the hospital, everything, simply left. And now he was with Krishna in pure Krishna consciousness. So um, this is what happens when Krishna appears at the time of death to a devotee who has dedicated his life to Krishna. Then uh, he removes all of the difficulties and the devotee can easily associate with Krishna and they become happy, and then that's the last thing they are. They're on their way back to the spiritual world. So a death for the devotee is actually quite glorious and actually very painless. One should not think, oh, I have to die, therefore there's so many pain. The pain comes through the attachment to the material body. Uh, as we become attached to Krishna, we also, we do, even in this world, while we're still functioning on a day-to-day -day level, we become less and less observant of what happens to our material body. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was performing his devotional activities with his devotees, many times he would go into ecstasy of devotional service. And he would still perform his daily activities, such as his noon bath and various other routines that he was accustomed to doing. It was like he did it mechanically without being aware that he was doing it because his consciousness was completely fixed on the spiritual platform. So I've also seen that happen and experienced that too, that when you get so absorbed in Krishna consciousness, the world around you just stops. <laughs> There's nothing happening. Even if you're undergoing tremendous pain, all of that is gone. Everything is, everything material stops and the consciousness is now within the transcendental realm. And then one experiences the, uh, the joy of being in that, that pure consciousness. So this is what happened to Bhishma Day. And then we offer a beautiful prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And his prayers are so beautiful, so descriptive of the qualities of Krishna, that these prayers are one of the most powerful prayers. And he's eventually, after offering his prayers, he, he attained to the transcendental realm. So if we like, we can go on to the the prayers for Bhishma Day. Next was Gurmash. Yeah. Enter into the prayers. Sri Bhishma Uvacha Viti Matir Upalkam Krishna Gurmash. Vachit Vihar Tun 
Um, sorry, um, your voice got cut in the middle, Guru Maharaj. That's why I thought you got disconnected. Okay, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Translation. Bhishma Dev said, let me now invest my thinking, feeling, and willing, which were so, which were so long engaged in different subjects in our occupational duty, in the all-powerful Lord Krishna. He is always self-satisfied, but sometimes being the leader of the devotees, he enjoys the material world, although from him only the material world is created. So here's the first of his prayers. Because Bhishma was a statesman, the head of a Kulu dynasty, a great general and the leader of Kshatriyas, his mind was strewn over so many subject matters, and his thinking, feeling, and willing were engaged in different matters. Now, in order to achieve pure devotional service, he wanted to invest all powers of thinking, feeling, and willing entirely into the Supreme Lord, being Sri Krishna. He is described here as a leader of the devotees and all powerful. Although Lord Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, he himself descends to earth to bestow upon his pure devotees the boon of devotional service. He descends sometimes as Lord Krishna as he is, and sometimes as Lord Chaitanya. Both are leaders of the pure devotees. Pure devotees of the Lord have no desire other than the service of the Lord. among such sattvatas, Vishpadev therefore had no other desires unless one is purified from all sorts of material desires. The Lord does nothing from one's leader. Desires cannot be wiped out, but they have only to be purified. It is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 10.10 by the Lord himself, that he gives instructions from within the heart of the pure devotee who constantly engages in the service of the Lord. So I'll stop there. So here it says that, that here's, here's the situation at the time of death that one absorbs themselves fully in thinking, feeling, and willing in their in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The process of, of purification means to leave behind all of our attachments. We, Brahmachari life is meant to teach one how to become detached. Vihasta life means to accept some attachments in the mood of detachment. In other words, they're accepting material facilities and to some degree, material enjoyment, but in the spirit of detachment from these things in order to support their execution of devotional service. But Grihasa life is not something that one dies in. It's a stage of life where one purifies themselves from the remaining material desires and after fulfilling all their desires in this material world, with wife, family, children, like that, then they move on to complete renunciation. Sometimes people say it's necessary to go through that stage in order to become detached from that stage. But that is not always the case. And there are people who can detach themselves from all the attachments, even without entering the hostile life. And sometimes when one enters the hostile life, they can't get out of it. Even as they get older, they still find themselves attached to that situation for whatever reason. Um, therefore, they uh, sometimes waste the remaining years of their life still in a situation which doesn't allow them complete detachment. But in any case, the whole process of Vanashram is to detach oneself 
from material attachment and ultimately become attached to Krishna, become attached to serving Krishna. That's the only goal of human life. And one accepts it and works to make that a reality, one will access to the special mercy of the Lord and ultimately achieve perfection. So here, And so pure devotees of the Lord have no desire other than the service of the Lord. And the Lord does not become one's leader unless one is free from all material desires. So getting rid of material desires, sometimes it says it's very difficult. Other times it says it's very easy. And so you might find, well, there's a contradiction in statement. Is it easy or is it difficult? There's one factor that makes the difference between how, whether it's easy or difficult, and that is that one has to be determined, and we use the word with emphasis, one has to be determined to stay fixed in the execution of devotional service and not be um, deterred from devotional service because as long as we stay fixed in devotional service, we are becoming purified and our material desires are becoming less. And ultimately, if we stay fixed accordingly, after some time, we see, we look at the material world and we think there's nothing in it for me. I'm simply happy in serving the Lord in the devotional service. Everything I need, everything I want is found in my service to Krishna. Then one, then when one will make, then the Lord will become one's leader. So Prabhupada says desires cannot be wiped out. They have only to be purified. What does that mean? We change material desires to spiritual desires. We can't stop desiring, but the desire for Krishna consciousness takes the form of activities in this material world that sometimes pattern material activities or material desirable activities, but actually it's just the external. The motivation behind the activity is the quality of that activity. So the materialists are doing the same things we are doing, but they're doing it in order to gain some sense gratification. The roadie doesn't look for sense gratification. Happy, simply engaging in devotional service. He gets Krishna Prashadam, he gets association with other devotees. He reads nice books and has many opportunities to do various things. Therefore, he's not looking for anything other than to perform devotional service. And when he's not engaged in devotional service, he's always thinking, what can I do now to, to stay fixed in my practice of Krishna consciousness? So as long as we, yeah, we have to become determined in Krishna consciousness. If we are not determined, then Maya will easily push us back into the material consciousness. That determination is a feature of the will. It's the feature of success. Okay, so we're hearing a little bit about Bhishma Dev and how he entered into the realm of pure consciousness as soon as Krishna appeared. He focused all his attention on Krishna. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for uh, such a wonderful class. Um, you mentioned a lot of points, uh, very important um, uh, to know about the difference between soul and the body and how we are attached to, the, to this material body. And also, you gave such nice examples and also reminded us about the glorious departure of uh, His Grace Janakina Prabhu. And, uh, and finally, you ended up with the uh, Grihastha Ashrama, how uh, we are not going to leave the body. We should not leave the body in the uh, Grihastha Ashrama. We should always purify our consciousness and leave all the material attachments. Thank you so much, Kurmash, for meeting us again. Um,
dear devotees, um, if, dear devotees, if you have any questions or comments or realizations or any clarifications, you can please unmute uh, yourself and or uh, raise hands or type it in the chat. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and please turn on your cameras if possible. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> So Guru Maharaj, uh, while devotees are thinking um, about any questions, so uh, yesterday I was reading uh, in second canto, um, uh, ninth chapter. So there also the same um, previous chapter, eighth chapter, uh, Maharaja Parikshit was asking questions to Sukadeva Goswami. So his question was, the first one was uh, about uh, um, why the jiva is in this material world? What is the difference between um, the Lord and jiva? So he, that was his question and uh, Sukadeva Goswami was answering uh, the same uh, concept like as you explained today. I was so wondering like yesterday only I read and it was a very nice uh, purport by um, strong and nice purport by Srila Prabhupada. Um, he was mentioning like how we are uh, dreaming. We are um, we are like a uh, in a dream, dreaming that our uh, in a dream we will think that our, that is the truth. So so just like how we are in this material world, he was comparing with the dream. So I just reminded that. Thank you. Yeah, and there's another world that's completely different from this world. <laughs> it's called the spiritual world. <laughs> Where life is eternal, full of knowledge, and full of unlimited happiness. And that's our, that's our nature. Because we are spirit, we can only find complete satisfaction in the realm of spirit. We can try to find it in this material realm, but because we are different than this material realm, we are not material. And it's like trying to mix two things that don't mix. So people find some satisfaction, but because it doesn't last. No one is ever satisfied with whatever they get. They keep trying for more or different things. Still much, yeah. Raj Prabhu, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Raj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. All glories to all of Vaishnavas. Maharaj, you said that determination was the key factor that, uh, that is, it causes whether one to become fixed in Krishna consciousness. So could you, could you tell us, advise us on how best we can fire up our determination? Let's mention there's a lot of statements in that regard. Um, well, there's different things that are being said. The one, one that's very easy and understandable is that you seek out association from persons who you can see are determined in their spiritual practice. That will help you to also to understand what determination is, and you will also get a little bit of it, that affection for determination. Uh, determination is watered down by sense gratification. So the more we engage in sense gratification, the more the less determined we become. Now, I'm not saying that we should give up sense activities, but those activities which are contrary to the practice of devotion to service, they are called material, and they lower our determination down, or they weaken our determination. So these are the two factors. And we also see that in our own lives, when we want 
to achieve something, such as we'll give the example when a, when one enters into a university, they, they realize they have a lot of work to do in order to get their diploma. They have to go to the classes, they have to hear the lectures, they have to take the tests, they have to take the exams. Many times they have to do their homework. And it goes on for year after year. So everyone is determined to stay in the in the process of education until they complete it. And then the result is they get their diploma. And that was their goal. So uh, we also have to understand that the determination requires some patience in order for it to develop to a point where it becomes something that uh, is natural, where in certain situations where sense gratification is being offered, our determination to become Krishna consciousness will immediately reject it. But if the determination to become Krishna consciousness is weak, then the effects of Maya's attempt to bring us into sense gratification become strong. And we can't resist it. We're easily pulled into it. So strengthen your Krishna consciousness and by strengthening your determination, then you can also stay fixed in that determination as you face the different challenges that come up in life. And you have to discriminate. And therefore, Sanatana Goswami explains that there are things that are favorable for Krishna consciousness and things that are unfavorable. Anukalena and Pratikulena. So Anukalena means accepting favorable things and Pratikula means to reject favorable, unfavorable things. So part of the process is to know what is favorable and what is unfavorable. And part of the process is that as we progress in our Krishna consciousness, we are always faced with choices. And then when we make the right choice, our determination increases. When we make the wrong choice, our determination is weakened. So we learn what inspires our determination and what weakens it by the choices we make when the opportunity presents itself. I could go, I could go to the temple and do some service, or I can stay home and watch this very interesting cricket match, which is a real match that it doesn't come out, it comes up every six years, the two rival teams who are rivals from the very beginning of now and all around the world, at least in these particular countries, everyone's glued to the TV set. It's the talk of the town, two rival teams, and therefore I have some history of just watching cricket matches. Well, yeah, I can go to the temple anytime. I gotta watch this match. I can't miss it. And then you do it, and then the next time you get another test, you're inclined to not take the right decision. Every time you're successful in choosing Krishna over Maya, you become stronger. Every time you choose Maya over Krishna, then Maya becomes stronger in your life. Maharaj. When you said association with devotees that are already determined, how can I tell which devotees have got that strong determination? By their symptoms. They're nicely engaged in devotional service. They don't waste time. They don't talk nonsense. You look for the symptoms, and then you also see who has them. 
there are devotees who are always looking for service, and there's other, other devotees who don't look for service and will take it once in a while when they're asked. But sometimes they will also reject it. But there's other devotees who don't wait for being asked, they're always looking to serve in different ways. These are the perfect people who are determined. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhuji. Nice question. Sri Devi Mataji, uh, please go ahead. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances on the Doris to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, thank you for pointing out about the bodily concept of life. As devotees, of course, we want to get above the bodily concept of life. But as we grow older, uh, the wear and tear on the body is such that we are forced to deal with all different bodily ailments. We are forced to take treatment. We are forced to take medicine. We are forced to change diets. We are forced to become more careful. And uh, we actually become more bodily conscious because of the aging process. It just needs more uh, attention, care, and things like that. So how can we tell when we are becoming too much involved and not doing enough service? Well, it says you have to keep body and soul together in order to execute devotion and service. So as one progresses in life, one has to adjust accordingly. But sincerity and honesty is the motivation behind. I will only take what I need in order to keep my body and soul together. I don't want to waste time in these things. I have to do it as a necessary burden. So one thing's like that. And uh, they don't waste time and overdo it because it doesn't give them any real pleasure to do that, but it's a requirement. So you learn, but the most important thing is you want to do it in the minimum amount of time and energy because life is short and you want to use all your time for Krishna's help. Body conception of life will make you start to think, well, Krishna consciousness is too, too hard. Better to just to relax and, you know, sip some tea at four o'clock and, uh, you know, uh, take a little rest. You know, it's something I've been depriving myself for years, now I get a chance. Thank you very much. I just don't like it, that's all. <laughs> it's a necessary burden. A serious devotee, when they take rest at night, they think, I can't wait to wake up so I can get back and devote to the moon. Not that, boy, I finally got to sleep. Wake me up when the new year happens, you know. You know it's not that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Scarlett Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, please accept my offense. It says, all glory is to Prabhupada and all glory is to your holiness and all glory is to all your devotees. Uh, I finally can talk and <laughs> ask my question. Um, there is, a, I have three questions, but I, I will ask and then you will say if it's stopped. Um, the first question is, uh, I, uh, all what I read is Lord Krishna says, uh, the, the person who sees me in everything, everything, it doesn't matter if it's flower, tree, tree uh, everything, then this devotee is doing what it's supposed to do. But then it now I'm in this situation that I think, okay, I am I am born in Iran and it happened so many bad things. 
at the moment. Uh, and what, how, how do I have to see this? Is it, is it Krishna? Well, because hmm? when, uh, when Arjun wanted to see the universal form, Krishna showed him. And the universal form is all the all the wonderful things that happen in nature and all the horrible things in nature. You can see the picture of the universal form. It has no, many heads. Some are very horrible looking heads breathing fire. And some are, some are very smiling heads with nice crowns on them. But Krishna has also the material energy in different forms of the material energy. Because ultimately he's everything. But he's he's not in the material energy, but he's there through his different potencies. So yeah, in one sense, everything is Krishna. But the thing is you can't worship him. the material energy is Krishna. You worship Krishna because it's the same personality as that. But you understand without Krishna, nothing can happen. So seeing Krishna and everything means to see everything in relationship to Krishna. Listen. Everything exists because of Krishna. Everything functions because of Krishna. And everything ends its existence in this material world because of Krishna. So he works through his energy. From the absolute point of view, the sun and the sunshine are both the same. Although both, both are different in one sense and the same in another sense. So in the same way, the uh, uh, devotee sees, oh, well, here's a desk. I'm sitting at my desk. And this desk made of wood. And the wood came from a tree. The tree was a living entity. And that tree was a spiritual being, part and parcel of Krishna. And the wood is one of the material features of earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and placebo. So earth is, uh, wood is also something from the earth. So, yeah, so we connect things back to Krishna like that. But the best way, a devotee doesn't use so much analytical mentalities to look at everything and analyze it. They see things in relationship to Krishna by using whatever they can in Krishna service. And they treat everything as the property of the Lord. Therefore, they don't abuse things, they don't neglect things, they don't waste things, they don't waste water, they don't waste electricity, they don't waste time. All of these are features of Krishna's energy. So becoming Krishna consciousness means to what know how to act in any situation. Okay. So what you experienced in the past also was an energy of the future. That's it. He's everything. He said I'm death also. And the intelligence of the intelligence. Everything is Krishna. Rasoham apsakuntiya prabhaspi sari surya pranavasa vivedi shuk subjake purusham nichu. I am the taste in water. I am the light of the sun and the moon. I am the syllable om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound and ether. I am the ability in all living beings. Over and over, he says he's the essence of everything that exists. That's what it means to see Krishna in everything. Nothing can exist without Krishna. My second question is, uh, I have heard many, many lectures. You're already on your second question. I don't even know if you got the first question. Yes, I got it. I got it. But if, 
if I answer, uh, if I ask my second question, it goes uh, together with the first one. That's why I, okay. I want to say. <laughs> um, yes. My second question, I, I listened to many, many, many of Prabhupada's uh, lecture. Uh, and in many of them, especially in beginning, he always tell, if you're Muslim, okay, practice your Muslim, do that. Uh, practice your uh, uh, spirituality in Muslim. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But then when I look at the situation today in many, many uh, religions, uh, there are so many crooked priests, spiritual masters, they embezzle money, they do many, many things that Krishna doesn't like it, has condemned it. And some of them you might ask, uh, consider they are devotees. Then I have to have this uh, uh, association to have this association. Associations with them, it's difficult. No, no How can no. I have association with them? First of all, you have to know what is real and what is not real. Who is genuine and who is not genuine? Who is a cheater and who is actually a real spiritual teacher? And all of the way you find out is by reading Srila Prabhupada's books and hearing his lectures. He makes that point constantly, showing the charlatans from the uh, true devotees, from the cheaters to those who are actually honest. He makes the point over and over again. Prabhupada exposed cheating, lying, uh, pretentiousness in all areas of life, not only in the spiritual, but even in the material. So we have a, an unlimited amount of information coming from Srila Prabhupada to help us discern, discern my means to uh, distinguish between who is real and who is not. One of the things he says that. A real spiritual master teaches how to serve and love God. If they're not teaching that, they're not a bona fide spirit. Spiritual master means one who is God consciousness and teaches God consciousness. Not some hocus pocus, nice spirituality. You press your nose this way and you can somehow or other levitate. These are, this is all this kind of, some kind of magicians. That's it. So, yeah, if you listen to Srila Prabhupada and carefully understand what he's saying, and he does it practically every lecture, he exposes what is real, what he tells you what is real and what is not real. And you can be, you can have faith in Srila Prabhupada because. He showed by his own example that he is genuine because he spread Lord Chaitanya's movement all around the world and he made people who are down and out persons who are addicted to all sinful activities. He made them into Krishna conscious devotees. So we can see that Prabhupada not only knew what is real and what is not real, he lived that. And he also taught others how to do the same. The, the information you have is available. You need is available. And if you're not sure, just ask me. I'll tell you. I can say I am so, so, so grateful to be under your guidance because there is, here I feel really, really, really safe. I am really safe. I feel very safe. But unfortunately, there are some things that, for instance, we have a spiritual uh, 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 preaching center, which is going to be closed as soon as it will be closed because there are no one who can take care of it. There will be no uh, spiritual center in Gothenburg. So what to do? I do it at home as, as much as I can. I try to do my best. I try to give away books uh, uh, to, to the people who I know that they are reading and so on. But that's all I can do, nothing more. Um, well, I think that you have to be careful. 
tried to find someone who also you could associate with. If you have one person who is close friends where you are, then everything becomes nice and easy. If you're alone, it's a little hard. All you need is one other person. So see who else has the same mindset as you. You can talk to and make friends with and share with them. That association will allow you to deal with the difficulties that come by way of uh, situations which are not favorable. It's, it's no, no, no temple should be closed. Prabhupada well, never wanted that. He said, once you establish the deity in your world, you can't stop it. So that's an offense. If the deity is there, they can't stop that worship. Then that becomes an offense. So they have to think about how to keep it open and not how to close it. That means they want to close it. If they want to close it, they will close it. If they want to keep it open, there are opportunities to keep it open. They just have to search it out and get the help they need. Our society is not simply limited to, to geographical areas. We are an international size society. So what happens on a local level is also an issue on the national level. So if the conclusion has been, after all attempts to keep it open, then there's no chance to keep it open. And now I'm not saying I agree with that, but it seems like if they've exhausted all possibility, and if they got the permission of the governing body commission, the, the uh, topmost management to close it, then no, I don't think that's the case. We're never interested in closing people. Not another one of them. Temples means where there's deities worship. Is there deities there? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It's not, uh, it's, as, I, as I said, it, it was from the beginning, it was a restaurant and a very, very little room uh, in back, uh, back side, uh, that, uh, which it was like a temple, a mini, mini temple. No, not so many, so much place to, to be uh, for so many. It's so little, but they call it a preaching center, not temple. I thought it was temple, but they call it preaching center. The preaching center is just more like something that's converted into a temple. The temple is when you have regular duty worship. When the dead deity is giving regular boga, when the deity is uh, following the protocol for worship, according to the direction of the, the local governing body commission. So I don't know what the situation is there. But, uh, I can't really give a, a judgment on it because I don't know the whole situation. I, uh, I will try to write for you the uh, more detail about it. I don't want to talk about it here. I will write for you the detail about it. But if it does close, then you have to see how you can keep the Krishna consciousness going. At least one other devotee to work with us to do that. Keep each other strong. I have one question, Tate, more. Then I'm. Uh, in our uh, body, is it the intelligent who um, control our uh, act, or is it our soul who is control more controlling? Is it mind. our uh, intelligent or mind, or yeah. uh, our soul? When we when we perform activities, we're using the mind, and when we're uh, performing devotional activities, we're Using the mind to engage with the soul in Krishna consciousness. 
The mind is the directing force. So it's either coming from the mind or coming from the soul. Coming from the soul means coming from the spiritual mind. So when we act in accordance to devotional service, we are act, we're using the spiritual mind. When we act according to material, we're using the material mind. So you have to transform the material mind into the spiritual mind. And use and act only for Krishna or devotional service. I have listened to your uh, lecture, mind uh, about mind. There is four lecture about mind, and there you have said engage in devotional service, uh, meditational um, uh, in, uh, instruction uh, to meditate on this instruction of the master, uh, uh, spiritual master and work for other welfare. There is a three uh, act that you have mentioned that is very important. Is there, One of is them there, is very yeah. difficult. It's, uh, these are the three ways to control the mind. So the mind's always thinking how to do things for, your, for me. So when you start working for the benefit of others, the mind is being uh, directed away from one's selfish interest and for the interest of others. And that's a combination of something that, that's material also, can be, but it can also be spiritual when you work for the benefit of all the other devotees. Meditating on the spiritual master's instructions means that every moment you're kind of starting to think, what do I need to do now in order to stay engaged in devotional service? And uh, the third one, what was the other one? Uh, being the, other one the second one was uh, to uh, follow the instruction of uh, spiritual master, to meditate, yeah. follow and meditate on the spiritual master uh, yeah, instruction. I, I mentioned that. What's the first one? Third one is to uh, work for other welfare of others. That's the third one. What's the first one? Which one? First one. First, one. first one is engage in devotional service. Yeah. So if you're already engaged in devotional service, the mind is controlled. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Matsuji. Does this answer your questions? It was so nice to hear from you. Okay. Uh, Revati Mataji, Gurmiraj, are we okay? Take one more question. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Revati Mataji, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Mataji. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Gurmiraj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sula Prabhupada. Um, so, Gurmiraj, you have mentioned like uh, being in a Grahastha life, we have to accept some material desires in the mode of detachment. So could you uh, uh, give us like, you know, how to practice that? Because being in an Indian family, um, born in an Indian family, we have like, you know, sometimes we have to meet uh, extended family relatives and, you know, uh, how can we, you know, we have the determination we need to be, you know, engaged in devotional service, but sometimes we may have to, you know, meet extended family and some desires will be there. So how can we balance and how can we still be determined? Like, you know, uh, we have determination, but still we need to go and, uh, you know, fulfill some of those things. Yeah, uh, just... Uh, when you go into the bathroom and take care of business, you don't stay in there. You take care of business and you get out. Oh. <laughs> so just take care of the business and get out. It's the same thing. <laughs> in other words, you don't enjoy being in the bathroom. You just have to do it. That's it. Yes, yes. So uh, also you must do... Uh, Necessary do 
it's a necessary burden. You know. But then you're always thinking, when can I get through with this so I can read Bhagavatam or can chant Hare Krishna and so stay with the bodhis? I can do something spiritual. Okay, Guru Maharaj. So to get that, also we also need to be very much um, uh, free of the material desire. Sometimes uh, we may all, all have like the obligation. Okay. Yes. Playing, you should play the role, but not not identify with mm -hmm. what it means. It's like we're all playing a role. I have to play a role as a guru. I'm not a guru. I'm the spirit soul. So that's the role I play. But if I think I'm a guru. And Prabhupada said, if you think you're a guru, then you're a bowler, a cow. <laughs> your identity is not guru, your identity is you very civil by Krishna and Mr. Dunn. But in order to serve, you serve in that way. So, so sometimes we have to take on some necessary family obligation. Or we think, boy, it's just, I can't wait till it's over. <laughs> So preparing our mood is also very important when we deal with these things. But if you like all of these things, then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Guru Maharaj, I can't. If you like all of these material social events, then, we'll, then you're going to get attached to it. And you're going to think, well, it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're put into this material world and we got a material family and we have a relationship based on the role we play as a mother, father, and child. But these are all roles we play in this world. So we're on the stage. Shakespeare said, the world is a stage. Mm. You're playing a part. That's a... Yes, so you, you might be playing a part as a woman in the Indian body in this life, the next life you might be playing a part as a man in a Western body. <laughs> so, mm. so which one is the real role? It's different acts going for the same play. That's mm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So I, I need to alert my mind and consciousness that you know I need to play a role, not get detached. Play, play a role, good, but don't, don't uh, get attached to the role. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, if it's okay, I have just one more clarification. Can I ask? Uh, this is like from Scarlett Mataji's first question. Um, you have mentioned how to become Krishna conscious and how to act in Krishna conscious. So this is very important. So, um, so everything is like, uh, in order to act in Krishna conscious, at certain level, we might not be pure. So when we are, we think we are right, we are doing everything is right, but we might not be dealing in a Krishna conscious way. So when we engage, when we are chanting, so will Krishna give us direction? Like, so we automatically, we deal with all these things in a Krishna conscious way. Because when we are dealing with the devotees, everything we might think from our side we are right, but we might not be right. So subtle things we might be doing so many wrong things uh, that we don't know. I mean, whatever we are listening, we, we are trying to purify ourselves, but there are so many subtle things that we don't know. So will Krishna help us from inside? You know, so we can. If you're sincere, he'll show you what the, what what's what you should do, what you should not do. But if you don't care, you know, then you just go around doing it because you've been doing it. Then you, you get trapped in that, that cycle. Okay. Ignorance is not an excuse. Mm -hmm. When you say, I don't know, that doesn't, that doesn't free you from the reactions of your activity. You go before a judge and you say, well, I'm from India, and I like to drive on the left side of the road. 
<laughs> so I want to drive on the left side of the road. And the police are, and the dead will say, well, here, this is America. You drive on the right side. I say, well, I'm an Indian. I have an Indian body, and I've been trained in, to drive on the left side, so I'm going to drive on the left side. <laughs> and so, and, and, or else you might say, well, I'm from India, and I didn't know I'm supposed to drive on the on the left on the right side. So, but you were driving on the left side, and you almost caused an accident, so you get a ticket. You say, "Well, I didn't know." Well, but the judge would say, "Ignorance is no excuse." Excuse, pay the fine. Yeah. So ignorance is not an excuse. We get. We, you know, the child thinks, oh, the fire looks so pretty and bright. Let me stick my hand in it. The fire will not spare the child because the child is ignorant. So that should not be the excuse. So more and more awareness, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The whole process is about learning about Krishna, learning how to serve Krishna. Learning how to avoid things that we don't need, we don't, that are not beneficial. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, thank you so much. Um, dear devotees, any more questions or clarifications? Announce the more program. Yes, good much. I have. I am going to announce it now. So tomorrow's uh, program is with these one Harrisburg devotees. Um, it's a Srimad Bhagavatam uh, verse number um, first canto, thirteen chapter, second verse, Gurmaraj. It will be the same time, regular time, twelve p.m. UK time, and four thirty p.m. No. No. Same time. Yes, good much. Same time. Yes. Uh, are you sure? Yes, good match. It's a Harrisburg devotees class, right? So it will be the same time. Yeah. Well, they made a concession because of me. And I was yeah. in Pennsylvania. So we keep the concession now, too? Yes, good match. Yes. We're keeping the concession. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. They don't, they don't want to go back to their normal time for everything. No, if if they go back to normal time, it will be your 5.30, Guru Maharaj, your 5.30 p.m. Um, so it will be like 1 p.m. UK time. So, but um, for your class, they have given the concession. They are in the 7 a.m. Eastern and a.m. 6 p.m. Yeah, fine. Just, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Guru Maharaj, for your uh, wonderful class today and nice uh, question answer session. Thank you, devotees, for participating. Um, to see you all soon tomorrow. Shri Prabhupada ki jai, Guru Maharaj ki jai. Give me the verse for tomorrow. Yes, Guru Maharaj. It's first canto, 13th chapter, 1.13.2, second verse. One, first canto, 13th chapter, verse number two. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, dear. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki jai, Maharaj ki jai. Thank you for your